Hello, hello everyone. My name is Andre. I am the founder of Border Zero, and today I'm super excited to be talking to you about Border Zero for AWS. Um, with uh, Border Zero, we're going to make it super easy for you to make resources into your AWS in your AWS account available, like EC2 instances, RDS instances, ECS. Um, and so we're going to demo that today to uh, give you a better overview. Uh, I'm not alone. I'm here with Adriano. Adriano is one of our awesome software engineers and helped build a lot of this and also used to work at AWS, so brings some really unique insights. So Adriano, say hello to the audience. Hello, world. Hello. <laughs> I'm super excited <laughs> to be doing this. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to do uh, do this with you. Uh, so let's uh, dive in, but maybe before we dive in, maybe we should level set a little bit. You know, What is the typical problem that we help people solve? Right. So the problem that we solve is something that's really common across at least all the organizations I've worked at, I've seen this happen where you start a new project or a new service and you start with a fresh, clean AWS account. You have a handful of people maybe that you need to grant access to, uh, and that's fair, right? But eventually your project grows, all of a sudden you're in an organization of 100 people and everybody has access to everything in the AWS account. Um, and it's it gets unwieldy, it's impossible to know, uh, to easily find out who has access to what and uh, how much of that access is needed. Um, and if you do end up that going that route of creating fine grained policies for everybody, it's it's a very time consuming process. Um, mm -hmm. And so with Border Zero, we, we essentially are, I guess, uh, a really fine layer that sits on top of your AWS en environment and in general simplifies access management. Um, All right. So so tackling that big sprawl of access, like every engineer's access to everything, you don't really know what's happening. And so giving you back some of that control and, and visibility. So um, instead of us talking, I understand you've prepared a little demo for us and we're gonna walk through that. You wanna quickly highlight what we're going to demo today? Sure, yeah. Um, so I have an AWS environment. Uh, I've got two different accounts. One is essentially a, a development environment. One is a staging environment. Uh, there's various resources within each of these accounts across multiple regions. And I'm going to be showing how easy it is with Border Zero to discover all those resources, uh, connect them, and grant access to your employees or clients to these resources. Sounds amazing. Uh, I'd say share your screen and show us what it looks like. Sure. Let's do it. All right. All right, here we are. So this right here is the Border Zero admin portal. Um, as an administrator, this is what you see. Uh, you've got a dashboard showing you recent sessions, active sockets, which are abstractions for services. You can also find all these over here. And this can be of various types. So we support exposing HTTP servers, SSH servers, databases, uh, and generic TCP sockets, uh, TCP servers over a TLS socket. And so sockets, connectors, and policies. These three constructs are our building blocks um, or constructs. So connectors are really what we're all about. These are software that you run within your private VPC or your private network, and it connects to multiple upstream services and exposes them without mm -hmm. uh, opening up your network or uh, this eliminates the need for a VPN completely. So your employees or your clients, they no longer have to be logging into VPNs and jumping through hoops just to get to their services. Um, and a bit more on how it works, these things, as I said before, they run in your network and they dial out to one of our global Anycast proxies. And from then on, we take care of authenticating and authorizing your users with mm -hmm. policies and also authenticating them against the SSO provider of your choice. Um, out of the box, we provide uh, Google SSO, GitHub SSO, or Microsoft accounts SSO. Uh, in addition to whatever IDP you have, uh, you can bring your own IDP. We support SAML and OIDC, as well as specific uh, services like Google Workspace and Okta Workforce. Uh, and so wow. we've got you covered. Sounds, sounds pretty action packed. And yeah, the one thing I wanted to point out here, maybe highlight is like this connector runs in your VPC, even private VPC, and you said it dialed out. So it only needs outbound access. And so you don't have to create any inbound um, access rules and stuff like that. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, so, so how do I get this in my AWS environment? What do I do? Yeah, so we've got a few installation options. Uh, you can create a connector here in the portal. 
uh, and follow the installation guide that we provide here so that you can have a web-based installer. I'm a CLI guy. I prefer to do it from the command line. I find it much easier. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to show you that. Let's do it. Cool. So first thing I'll do is authenticate against AWS. All right, so we're going to just get an AWS login. Yeah, and now go. we're logged in. And the mm -hmm. next thing we'll do is we're just going to do a border zero, connect or install, dash dash AWS. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that this command has access to the AWS profile or the AWS credentials um, mm -hmm. required to for the AWS account where you want to install the connector. Uh, and so I want to install it in my staging AWS account, which is mapped to this staging profile. Uh, so there we go. We've defined our profile and then border zero connector install AWS. Hit enter. It's going to log me in with border zero. Oh, look at this. Yeah. It's a very nice interactive prompt. It runs me through all the questions required to find out where to run this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really like US East One. <laughs> the only person in the world who likes US East One. I like the rocket. <laughs> <laughs> US East one does have a lot of outages to say recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it asked me for my VPC, the subnet within that VPC, and then a connector token. So these tokens are how uh, the connector is going to authenticate against the border zero service. And we store those. The AWS installer s stores that securely in SSM parameter store. And so I'm being prompted for the path or the name of the parameter where I want to store this token. Mm -hmm. I am happy with the default here, so I'm just going to press Enter. And there it goes. You're going to note that a new connector was created. These three plugins were enabled, which we'll get to in a bit about what plugins are. Uh, a new token was created for the connector to authenticate. And the SSM parameter in, in my AWS account was created where the token was stored. And then this CloudFormation stack gets kicked off, uh, and it's going to create all of the resources required um for the connector to have access to all the things and uh as well as have a bit of high availability for example if the connector goes down a new one will come up uh for whatever reason the machine crashes i don't know if lightning hits the building the aws data center where this is running uh, mm -hmm. a new one will come up i see so this cloud so just to see yeah so uh you created a connector using the border zero api created a token then we stored that token into ssm parameter store uh, and then we kicked off this cloud formation stack that creates an EC2 instance, IAM role, all the right permissions. And so that's now being spun up. Uh, how long does it typically take for this machine to be uh, available? By the way, this is pretty cool. This is it. Like after this, the machine's just there. It will yeah. register itself and you're good it to go. It should come online in about three minutes, uh, the mm -hmm. whole end-to-end -end installation process. From the moment you see this banner, if you just hit enter, 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 three minutes, and you'll have something online and ready to discover resources in your AWS environment. Uh, awesome. In fact, we can go back to the connectors page. We should see our new AWS connector here. It's currently mm -hmm. offline. It's never been seen, but within a matter of minutes, we should see it. Um, and so this is in my staging environment. I'm going to rename my connector to staging AWS connector. All right. There we go. Cool. And we so what, a... what do you have in your AWS account that we're, we're going to make available? Uh, there's all kinds of things. There's a couple RDS uh, instances. There's a couple EC2 instances. And there's also a, um, a couple of ECS clusters for my various applications. Yeah. You're, you're, you have lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. Uh, okay. And it's all easily discovered with uh, our connector. And so while that comes online, um, I can just demo with the dev AWS connector. Sure. So one of the things to note uh, when this installer comes up is, again, three plugins were enabled. So what are these things, right? Um, we, we support discovering resources dynamically uh, from the point of view of this connector software, right? And so the EC2 discovery plugin, ECS discovery plugin, RDS discovery plugin, they discover EC2 instances, uh, ECS services, and RDS instances, respectively, in your AWS environment. They have a, by default, they only scan the, um, the AWS region where your connector is running, but you can change all this. Um, so for my development one, I've already changed it to scan more regions. 
than the mm -hmm. default one. I, I have stuff in the Tokyo region, um, Virginia, and California. And so I've chosen to scan those three regions. And as soon as you enable these things, it's pretty much immediate, the discovery. Um, here are all of our discovered resources in this development account. Mm, so a bunch of EC2 instances and RDS instances I saw, right? That's yeah. right. Cool. Yeah. And so um, it just picks that up used by so the the because when you spun up this connector, it had a bunch of IAM policies. And so it has the permissions to basically scan the various AWS APIs to discover these things. That's it's not right. necessarily doing a network scan, uh, more an API scan. And then I think you mentioned it does some more scanning afterwards as well, right? Yeah. So it, it initially does a um, an API scan where it hits the various AWS services to list and describe these resources. Uh, but it also runs some additional validation. So for EC2 instances specifically, um, not only we know whether the instance exists or not, but we also run um, oh, reachability cool. checks. Cool. We actually mm -hmm. do some network checks. Uh, and so for this instance in particular, for example, uh, we know that we cannot reach it by private DNS name or by private IP, but we can reach it through its public DNS name and public IP. Mm. And That's we do that. Probably because it runs in a different region or something. That's right. I see. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and so, yeah, let's go ahead and create. You see this big arrow on the right? This is how uh -huh. you convert one of these discovered resources uh, into an actual socket, which your employees or clients can then connect to. I see. Um, All right. Click that yeah, button. For it sure. Once so you press, I can see it. There's this, Ubuntu, this instance called Ubuntu Box in the Tokyo region, AP Northeast One. Let's do that. Um, and so since we're able to find out some information about this uh, instance, we're able to make some deductions on how you may want to connect to it. Uh, for example, we were able to detect that you had, uh, that this instance had registered itself with AWS SSM, and AWS SSM is one of the upstream types that we support. Uh, and so mm. can we, the connector can then connect to this machine using AWS SSM. Uh, that's one oh, of the options. Well, that's actually pretty neat. So. Uh, so we have different ways. So we have the connector, and then the connector needs to connect to the machines that you want to make available. And mm -hmm. we have different ways to do that. Um, That's right. And you we want to click support. On that? Yeah. Oh, wow. So for SSH uh, resources in particular, we support standard SSH where you provide the username and password or private key. Um, or we also support using Border Zero certificates where Border Zero takes care of. Um, signing certificates, and you mm -hmm. just have to provision your upstream machine to accept certificates signed by us. Mm -hmm. um, SSM, which is the default I just mentioned, AWS EC2 Instance Connect, which is an AWS API uh, where you can push ephemeral, um, as as ephemeral asymmetric uh, public keys, and your private key essentially is, is short-lived and and then you can use it to connect to your mm -hmm. upstream host that is actually my preferred method uh, and so let's go with that all right uh aws authentication so, so i just strategy. want to call out that's that's actually for for like an ssh instance you have like i don't know six different ways to connect to it and what i think is pretty unique here worth highlighting that some of them have you know that's part of the close integration with aws that we support these aws native uh protocols to authenticate and to connect yeah. That's right. Yeah, we've spent uh, we've invested heavily into making anything you do on AWS um, be supported by us. Yeah, and and the big advantage for these kinds of things like SSM or even EC2 Instance Connect is like you don't have to give us any credentials, right? So as long as this machine has the right credentials, this machine's owned by you. You're that. So so we cannot connect to these things. So that's uh, yeah, powerful. That's right. All right, go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead. Everything seems to be populated the way I want it to be. Um, optionally, you can also, you know, if you don't want to use the uh, IAM role of the connector instance, you can provide a different AWS profile or uh, static mm -hmm. credentials. But I'm happy with that. Um, one thing I am not happy with, so SSH username, it will prompt my clients for a username. I actually just want them all to authenticate with username Ubuntu. Okay. But I can actually hard code that here. Uh, connectors, 
I can add this to multiple connectors. Um, and this is for reasons of high availability. Maybe you want to run two connectors per region, two connectors per account, or whatever, whatever setup you need for the requirements of your applications. You might have high availability requirements, or you might just want to be sure that you'll always be able to connect. And so you'll run multiple of these things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm OK with just connecting it to my dev AWS connector. And then tags. You can add arbitrary key value pairs uh, for you to organize sockets however you'd like. Um, by default, we populate these three, which are essentially for um, organizing them based on AWS account and AWS region in the client portal, which I'll demonstrate in a little bit. So I'm happy with all this. I'm just going to hit Create Socket. Let's do it. Yeah, and immediately it pops up. I am already able to connect to it here. It says it's alive. Yeah, <laughs> it is alive. <laughs> a big blue button. You you have to press it, I feel. Let's go check it out. So I'll authenticate with this organization. Oh, what's it? So this is, uh, what, what, what are we looking at here? It's a different page, right? Yeah, so now I'm being authenticated as a client, uh, a client user, a client of this organization. Now I need to satisfy the SSO configuration that my administrators have configured for this mm -hmm. organization. Uh, I'm going to log in with Google. Oh, wow. Yeah. I could see where neat. you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm All just right. going to allow this. Then I'm taken back to the client portal where we're finally going to connect to this upstream machine in Tokyo. All right. So this looks pretty. This is like a we web based go. SSH terminal. We have uh, web based, web native SSH uh, and database clients. Cool. So, wow, this, okay. So you clicked on this big blue button. It asks you to do some SSO magic and now you have a shell using your browser. Um, I think it's interesting worth noting that other than the SSO credentials, you were never asked for a password or a key or anything, right? So you're That's just right. logging in to an EC2 instance with just your SSO credentials. That's right. We don't like passwords. We don't like static credentials of any type. This is <laughs> passwordless uh, SSH essentially. Exactly. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. And so now we're in the machine. Now, we're, whenever we're done, we can just leave. And there okay. we go. The session right. has been terminated. That um, was making an EC2 instance available. Pretty that's easy. That's right. Let's try a database now. All right. So I remember I saw, seeing some database credentials. Yeah. Oh, or, and note uh, that our, um, our staging connector has now come online. Mm hmm. And if we go to the discovery tab, we see that also it has already discovered a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we'll look at that later. I actually am interested in the database that my dev connector found. OK. So we found two RDS clusters, actually. Yeah, we found a Aurora MySQL um, instance and a Postgres instance. Okay. Which one would you like to connect to? Um, I'm a bit of a MySQL guy, typically. So let's do that one. Let's do that one. Uh, I don't like this name, so I'll just do my MySQL DB. Looks like everything's pre populated. Yeah. Right. Aside from that, everything is pre populated. It's defaulted to AWS IAM, which I have not set up in this database. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to note this is actually the recommended way to connect to databases. Um, it's not using long term or long lived credentials, it is rather to use the um, IAM authentication for RDS databases uh, feature of cool. AWS. Yeah. yeah, and the way that it's works yet is yet another integration. That's right, a tight knit with AWS integration. Uh -huh. um, and what this does is essentially you'll you're, you'll be able to trade um, temporary IAM credentials for temporary uh, database credentials mm -hmm. in order to log into this database. But I actually only have static credentials for this particular database. I know that the admin user is called admin. And for the upstream password, so I don't actually know the password, uh, but I know that I have it in AWS uh, SSM parameter store. And we support oh. various types of uh, upstream sources for secrets. So you can read secrets from, you, you could totally hard code your password here, and we will store it securely. We'll encrypt it. We'll do all our due diligence, making sure you're your password is stored uh, following best practices. However, you can also choose to have the password somewhere in a file in your connector's file system, 
or the environment of your connector's runtime, uh, or in AWS Parameter Store, or AWS Secrets Manager. These are the, the currently supported secrets upstreams with more to come. Mm -hmm. um, however, the way to set these up, so we have a bit of a syntactic sugar here. You're going to say from AWS SSM, followed by your parameter name, which in the case of the password for this database is demo MySQL DB password. OK. So yeah, just to recap here. So basically, you're saying we integrate with various secrets managers. So again, we don't really want you to give uh, us your credentials. Uh, you can if you really want to. And like you said, we'll do our best to treat them as good as we can. But ideally, you just integrate with uh, your existing secrets manager, like you're showing here with uh, Parameter Store. That's right. Cool. And then it's not us fetching the secrets. It's the connector that runs in your environment. Yep. Yeah, we have awesome. no visibility of these secrets. Cool. Great. So this looks good to me. Host name's right. Port is right. My admin and password are set. I want to connect it to the dev AWS connector again. And I'm ready to create my not my new socket. Awesome. And again, so that was pretty easy because basically everything was pre-populated and all you put in was the username and password. Or that's right. The reference to the secrets manager. Yeah. Awesome. So this is ready to connect. Let's try it out. Oh, dude, and we're this there. reminds me of uh, PHP my admin, but prettier. <laughs> I think that predates me. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, this is no PHP? No PHP. No, none whatsoever. <laughs> what, what is it? What is it? Uh, so the, the whole client is uh, a mix of WebAssembly, uh, Go compile to WebAssembly, and oh, okay. JavaScript. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it looks really pretty. So it's basically an online database client that runs fully in your browser. That's right. And it's fully featured. You can do anything you can do with your regular clients. Uh, in fact, you can do more than that. So here, for example, I've ran this query, and I have history. There's this history uh -huh. tab, and I can run, I can you know, keep track of my most used uh, queries and just be able to one-click run them. Very nice. Um, not only that, but... There's also a schema tab where you can explore the schema of the various tables in your database. It's very neat. Cool. Oh. Yeah. And uh, since we're here, I'll just show you what the what the client portal uh, dashboard looked like. So, so oh, the main yeah, page kind of looks client. like uh, Okta. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty similar. Uh, and so you can see that we've organized your your things, all your sockets, all your services by uh -huh. um, AWS account and region. And in addition to that, you can filter based by uh, name. We do substring matching, so you can search for whatever you want here. Cool. So super easy to find all the things that you have access to, all that kind of good stuff. But you know, Adriano, I am a little bit more old school, so these web things are cool, but. Um... Can I use the CLI as well? Because I'm of pretty course. picky about uh, <laughs> my tools. Yeah, yeah, we support definitely a, a CLI-based uh, flow. Uh huh. So let me clear my screen. First thing you'll want to do to use our uh, CLI-based tooling is board your client login. Uh, Ask me to select a um, an organization. I chose the same one that we were in. I'm going to authenticate this device to authenticate on my behalf. And there we go, login successful. So now we are authenticated as a client in this mm -hmm. terminal. And I can run border zero client SSH. This is going to give me all the various uh, options oh. for services of SSH in my organization, essentially the, the equivalent of seeing the, the view here. Mm. But on the CLI, so I yeah. can just see what I have access to. Click on one, and yeah. I'm in. Let's go with uh, Ubuntu Box, which was the, the same machine that we connected to before. It's in Tokyo. Ubuntu. And there we yeah, go. There we go. We're in. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, this looks like the shell I'm used to. Yeah. <laughs> we got you covered. Awesome. <laughs> and how about databases then? Yeah, so we also support hooking up to whatever your favorite database client is. Um, all you need is to make sure you have that client downloaded. Uh, but if you run Bordezio Client DB, 
So here's my the MySQL database that we added a moment ago. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hit enter. And then I can choose a client. Uh, I can expose this connection as a local listener to use any client that, that is not CLI based, for example, uh, like MySQL Workbench or something like that. Uh, I, I really like my CLI, so I'm going to go with that. And the database schema is MySQL. And there we go. We're in. Oh, wow. This is a pretty client, too. Yeah. But uh, again, so I guess in this case, you did this login initially, and then you had you could see what you had access to in terms of like SSH servers or databases. And um, when you connect to this database, you were not prompted for like a password or anything, or not even a username. It just said, yeah. oh, sure. And so how does that work? Like, like if the... I needed access to this thing, like how do you control that? Oh, yeah. So uh, two different, to answer both your questions, how does this work? Uh, all of the configuration on how to authenticate to the actual upstream service, it's all configured by administrators. And your mm -hmm. connector knows all of this configuration and then uses it to connect to the upstream service. Now, the way you authenticate as a client to the service is uh, an administrator of this organization has to give you access or add you to the policy of the individual services. So for example, if we go to my organization's policies, I have one org-wide policy. We support organization-wide policies and also just regular policies that you can attach to various sockets if you don't want them to apply to everything in your organization. Mm -hmm. Currently, I only have uh, one, and it applies to all of my sockets because it's org-wide. Uh, let's have a look. So here we have the clauses who, where, when, right? Very dumbed down, simple way of granting access. Uh, the who, you can allow uh, entire domains or email addresses. Uh, the where, you can allow specific IP addresses, uh, allow countries, disallow countries. Um, and when, you know, time of day, that kind of thing. If you only want, uh, if you only want your employees, for example, accessing, say, an RDP server or something like that during office hours, you can also enforce that kind of um, requirement. Uh, and in terms of giving you access, let's go ahead and try that. So right now, only I have access um, to all of the services in my Border Zero organization. Um, I'm happy to give everyone with a borderzero.com email uh, access. So all I have to do is remove my email from there, add allow domains there, and there we go. Now you should have access to everything in this organization. Mm, and it's I that see. simple. I see. Um, OK. And, and so should I log in, or are you going to? What's your idea? Um, I can demonstrate what you would see before and after access. Sure. So yeah, I'm yeah. going to go ahead and remove this domain-wide uh, rule here. And I'm going to allow nobody, essentially. Or let's make it simple. I'm going to allow myself again, but I will disallow Canada, which is where I am located. So uh, essentially, these policies are very basically enhanced firewall rules. Like no longer are we talking about IP addresses, but first of all, everything seems to be centered around single sign-on, like identities, and then you can augment it by countries and time of day and IP addresses and so on and so forth. Yes, it's uh, it's essentially exactly what you said. It's an identity-based firewall almost uh, with enhanced rules based on IP addressing, location, um, and well, these policies are, are actually infinitely flexible. We we allow you to hook up your policy to a generic HTTP server, for example, and have your own server determine whether access should be allowed based on mm. various rules. Like a, like we, a webhook type thing. Hey, is Andre allowed access? Yes or no? I can make my own logic. That's right. You can mm -hmm. do. You can extend it infinitely. You can make it. You know, we've we've played around with really silly rules like allow access only if it's raining. And hooking up to the weather API, yeah, crazy stuff like that. Everything is possible. <laughs> it's yeah, I've really heard awesome. people uh, play with it. Like they, they hooked it up with their internal HR system, and mm -hmm. it's like, hey, is this person on PTO or did he uh, or she complete her security training? Stuff like that. And so Dang. these are things that we obviously don't know, but we allow you to integrate uh, it with your internal systems. So that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. All right, so cool. uh, you've essentially blocked yourself out, I think, right? That's because right. I blocked anybody access, in Canada. 
yeah. uh, including myself. And so no let's see what that looks that. like. I'm going to connect again to this Ubuntu box machine in Tokyo. Yeah. And I couldn't. I was blocked. Um, and so now here comes another one of our key features, session logs. Um, session logs are basically every session that happens against any single one of your services, uh, you will be able to see here. Not only you will know if it's blocked or allowed, uh, my last one was blocked, we can see it clearly here, uh, but we also tell you why. Mm -hmm. Country code That's didn't it. match policy. Yeah. Um, so very clear, I know that the, the, the countries that were allowed by the policy, this user was not allowed because it it's their country did not match the policy. Yeah. Um, not only that, not only can you see whether something succeeded or failed and know why, but you can also see recordings. So look oh. at this one, for example. This is for uh, the database that we connected to earlier. Let's check out the authorization result. It tells me why the uh, session was allowed. And I can also find out what exactly happened. I can look at the text-based, uh, what are all the queries that were mm. ran in this session. I can also watch a video if I prefer to do that. Um, Oh, that's so pretty neat. Great. So, so actually, you know, one of the problems always with databases is like not just access. So normally, when I access a database, like I join a company, it's like, hey, I, I need to make a, a change to a database, like add a column or something. I was like, hey, I'll do that. And then it's like, okay, jump on the VPN. And when you're on the VPN, you can jump on this Bastion host, and then you can use, you know, MySQL client to connect to this thing. And it's like, oh, where are the credentials? Well, go to the password manager, and I find the shared credentials yeah. that never get rotated. Um, so in this case, none of that was relevant. I just found the database and if the policy allowed me uh, I would have access and not only that now you can see exactly who executed what query and by I say who it's not like uh, the username DB admin that we all share no it said exactly Adriano at borderzero.com and I can see what queries you did at what point in time from which IP address etc that's right um, cool yeah and I of what you said, something that really resonates with me is, yes, handling credentials. You're really trusting your employees who will most of the time do the right thing, but sometimes we forget, right? We're all human. Maybe we copied our, pass our shared password into a notepad because we'll use it in 30 minutes. We never deleted it. You know, yeah. things like that happen all the time. And so just making it impossible for that is, is yeah. better than trust. It's um, also very rare to see those shared credentials being rotated. You never get um, rotated. Yeah. <laughs> but I see other ones too, right? So yeah. uh, we have data sessions. This. Yeah. Uh, this is a an SSH session uh, to that Ubuntu machine. Let's check out this replay. Dude. Yeah. So that's an actual video at the same speed and I think even the same screen size of what happened. Yeah. And well, we know that in practice, um, you as an administrator, you might be interested in, in, in watching this video, but in practice, you're going to be feeding this to your SIEM or some other kind of uh, you know threat detection or correlations tooling. Uh, and so we support just downloading the text form all the, always uh, in a mm -hmm. well-known format, uh, ready to be fed onto whatever is next in your pipeline. Very cool, very cool. So um, yeah, so what we saw here with the session logs, as you can see everyone who's in, we saw the replay, we can see the identity, et cetera. So this is really, um, again, if I think back about a firewall, this is sort of, a lot of firewalls have sort of the live flows, but this is much more than the live flow. It's also what protocol, what SSO identity, and the ability to kind of hook in. Um, so some firewalls have the ability to, to also, you know, terminate uh, a flow, for example. Yeah, we support doing that as well. Um, so quickly, I'm going to remove that uh, country block in the policy such that Maybe I have access back again. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Um, so I'm going to have a session to this. You need to box. wait for a reload or something? or No, this all happens on the fly. It's immediate. Um, oh, wow. And and even the... Um, so not only do we support terminating sessions manually, uh, so as an administrator, I can go here, see that this session is ongoing, and I can terminate it. And that should have kicked us out here oh, immediately. Right. Real time. Yes. Um, and not only do we support doing things like that manually, which in practice you might not be doing, but you might be changing this policy. Um, and so 
if at any moment that, that we do continuous evaluation of this policy. Mm -hmm. um, so not only can you manually kick someone out, but if you make a change to the policy and that session is found to no longer be uh, compliant with this policy, the session will be killed automatically by our system. I don't believe you. Show it to me. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, can Plug I into one thing? So now you're back in, and uh, let, let's let's kick out the uh, Canada again. Let's do that. So we go back to the policy. We go there, and we say disallowed country uh, Canada, or yeah, sorry Canada. So you update this. Yeah. So we've updated the policy, and we move over to this. Good. And it's already gone. It's gone. Continuous authorization at work. That's right. So that's pretty cool, right? Because a lot of these systems is like policy evaluation is done at the time of entry, essentially. Like, does Adriano mm -hmm. have access? Uh, which is good, but policies can change, or time yeah. of days change, or your your context of your device may change. And yeah. so this is all real time, continuously. Yeah, and more so it, again. This also, if you had some kind of uh, customized server that you've hooked up to your policy, and you're doing um, authorization in your very own server with your very own logic that is going to be executing continuously um, mm -hmm. at a reasonable rate. Um, and the result would be the same. If your server cool. says you're no longer allowed, you'd be kicked out. All right. So um, so maybe back to AWS. So what, what you showed me here is uh, it was super easy to install the connector. It was uh, easy to then discover the resources. You clicked on stuff, and like a minute later, everything was there, and we could log in. Um, but I think there's a few more AWS integrations you wanted to show, right? Yeah. Um, I can show you. There's a couple we can show you. Uh, let's go with one for ECS. Uh, we can discover an ECS service and expose it. Let me just clean up my policy, make sure that I am great. I will be allowed. <laughs> oh, you're creating a new policy? Oh, yeah. Great. I am I need to remove that disallowed. There we go. I see you have a JSON view too for the geeks. Yeah, we do have a JSON editor if you do prefer that. I see. Cool. Uh, or for API, um, you know, controlling policies on API. And we also have a Terraform provider, but we're not going to be showcasing that now. Uh, showcasing <laughs> that now, uh, but worth noting for sure. So going back to our connectors, um, plugins. I know that I have some ECS uh, services in US East two. All right. So you basically tell it to uh, scan ECS in US East two. Okay. US East two, and immediately we see those come up. Damn, real time, all that. Huh? Yeah, real time. And so let's expose this one. So I don't like this long name. It's the name of my service. Uh, I just want to call it API. Okay. API ECS service. So this is your API on ECS. A lot of stuff's yeah. filled out. I see everything that's all is just... filled out. I'm extremely happy with it. I'm just going to go and create the new connect, the new socket. Right. And that's immediately Good. available. Um, All right. through our staging AWS connector, which is the connector that we installed uh, with the CLI at the beginning of this show. Right. Uh, let's just connect to it. Great. So oh, I'm prompted to choose a task. Uh, you know, oh. ECS services, you can have multiple tasks, uh, multiple containers within each task. And so we give you a nice prompt to pick, essentially, oh, what you want wow. to connect to. And ah. now you're in your ECS container. That's right. Neat. Very easy. Took me no time. So, you know, within 20 seconds, we discovered the ECS service. We created a uh, border zero socket for it, and we've we've connected as a client. Cool. Very uh, very neat. Yeah. Uh, another one of our AWS integrations worth noting is uh, logging. We integrate with CloudWatch for logs. Um, I can show you what that looks like. So, organization settings. We have a bunch of um, configuration for your organization as an administrator. You can create um, you can invite other users, other administrators, uh, create access tokens. You can add custom domains as well, identity providers. Uh, these are the three default ones. But again, we support adding OpenID Connect, SAML, Okta Workforce, Google Workspace. Um, notifications, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, I'm going to delete this one because I don't need it anymore. 
and integrations. I'm going to get rid of this one. Cool. All right. So let's add an integration. Let's add an integration. Uh, I want an AWS CloudWatch logs integration. And so for the integration guide, you might want to read. It's a bit of a, it's one of the meatier integrations. You'll probably want to read the Border Zero documentation for it. Uh, but if you're tech savvy and if you're well versed in AWS, you probably just want to launch the CloudFormation stack and kick off the process that creates everything in your AWS account that we need in order to push logs to it. Um, and if you want a bit more info, we have a bit more info on what each of these required parameters is and what it's mm -hmm. used for. Um, All I want to do is press the button, man. All right, let's press the button. <laughs> <laughs> launch the stack. More CloudFormation. Great. So we're taking here um, the all these things except for the assume role external ID are pre-populated. Um, the external ID is is a bit of a it's kind of like a password that Border Zero will use um, in order to assume a role in your account that it will use to write logs there. Uh, so I'm happy just writing some nonsense there. Um, great. Let's just hit create stack. And so there it goes. This is going to kick off the CloudFormation stack um, out of a, a template that we publicly share. Uh, and it's going to create a couple of things, a CloudWatch log group in order for Border Zero to write logs to in your account, uh, a role for Border Zero to assume in order to have the permissions that Border Zero needs to write logs to your account. And that's it. Those are the two resources. Mm -hmm. It should take about 30 seconds. Lots of cloud formation. Yeah. It is kind of cool. It's not the topic, but we, we do try and make it as easy as possible with you know vetted cloud formation templates that you can obviously review, uh, but um, it makes it a lot easier to get going. We saw one when you spun up the connector. We're doing it again here. And if you don't like cloud formation and more like a Terraform person, uh, we'll spend more time on that uh, in another time, but we support that as well. Yeah. Totally. The the neat thing that I like to um, I like about CloudFormation is we give you a template, right? If you're not happy with it, you can go ahead and modify this. You can mm -hmm. add permissions to it, remove permissions to it. Um, so, for example, the the connector template uh, gives the connector access to describe all ECS services in the account. But maybe you know that you'll never have ECS services, or maybe you just don't want to expose them over Border Zero. You can go ahead and remove that from the template and yeah. apply your changes. Uh, and so our template is our uh, CloudWatch logs integration stack is now applied. And I can just go to the outputs tab here and copy paste these things onto the required parameters here. So right. name, CloudWatch integration, my CloudWatch logs integration. Uh, we need a CloudWatch log group ARN, which is this guy here. We also need an IAM role, ARN, and the external ID. Cool. And from then on, we have a CloudWatch logs integration. Um, now, until you actually hook up this integration to something, uh, nothing's going to happen. This is kind of like a, a resource that sits in your account until you make use of it. Mm -hmm. And so one way to make use of this particular integration is we go to the Notifications tab. Click new notifications, and we see this AWS CloudWatch logs um, option here. So basically, we're going to be sending all notifications from this Border Zero organization to our CloudWatch logs integration. All right. Cool. You enable it, disable it, and then control what kind of events you want to send to CloudWatch. That's right. And we support sending uh, succeeded and failed sessions. Maybe you only care about failed sessions. Um, and we also support audit events. These are API audit events, so administrative actions taken against your Border Zero organization. Maybe mm -hmm. your administrator, I don't know, they invited their cousin to the org for fun. Maybe you want to know if that happens. Um, and so we support also sending audit events to CloudWatch. All right. Um, for now, I only care about sessions, really. So I'm going to go with new and failed sessions. Uh, and this is a drop down which asks you which integration you 
you want um, to point this notification rule to. Uh, we only have one CloudWatch integration, and so it's set to that. And I'm going to go ahead and create that. And from this point forward, uh, every single session that happens in this organization will result in a log being written to CloudWatch in my AWS account. All so right. let's give it a try. Uh, let me navigate to the CloudWatch service. Log groups. There should be our Border Zero Events Sync log group. Currently, it has no log streams because there have been no events in my organization. Uh, but let's change that. So I'm going to connect again to this ECS service um, that we added to just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. So great. We are now connected. I'm going to leave. Uh, I'm going to change my policy just to make sure that I am disallowed on the next time. Just going to remove my email. Ah, I guess we need someone there. I'll go with, uh, I'll keep my email. Right, and I will I, remove Canada again. Poor Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll try to connect once again. Not yeah, allowed. No real time. Yeah. And so now we, there should be some actions uh, logged in here. All real time shows yeah. up. So we have a log stream per day. Uh, today is September 29. And there is our sessions. Nice. Uh, I guess the other one hasn't come in. But uh, here's the allowed set, the first allowed session. Yeah. Very cool. And, so now uh, we see the same thing in CloudWatch. And, and then from here on out, people can use whatever favorite log parsing and tooling they're used to analyze this, forward it to their sims or whoever else is analyzing this kind of data. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can use your, you know, the same. If you're used to using CloudWatch, you're probably somewhat proficient in the CloudWatch query language. And that is your preferred way of looking at data. And so this is one way to achieve that. Maybe you want to, I don't know, parse the fields here and, and run some analytics, mm -hmm. uh, some more smarter analytics um, and you can do that using CloudWatch now that you've hooked up CloudWatch to your organization. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, Adriano, we covered a lot of stuff and um, and there's even more to discover, but we want to focus uh, this talk mostly around AWS. Um, and maybe just to quickly recap. So what I saw was we installed this connector and we saw the AWS integration with that, how easy it was. You, you fired off this CloudWatch or this, this um, uh, CloudFormation template using the CLI. A few minutes later, it was there. Then we saw these plugins that discovered all the resources. And then you just clicked on stuff, and it just magically showed up like immediately. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about the various other integrations, including like uh, the various secrets managers that we support, including uh, parameter store as well as secrets manager and, and various others. We looked at CloudWatch uh, as an integration. So, yeah, that's that's pretty rich um, in terms of integration. And I think also for users, yeah, or administrators, this is super easy to to provide access to only those engineers that need it, and and you demo that with the policies. Uh, and then I would also say, as an engineer, I mean, the web client is this awesome, super easy to discover stuff and. I only need my single sign-on credentials. And I tried to trick you there with CLI, but it sounds like we have lots of CLI support too. So, so that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I think pleasure to use for engineers. Um, and I think very important there is like a lot of times these types of solutions create additional friction for engineers. Like, oh, we need more visibility and control. So you need to jump through all these additional hoops. Yeah, but it's funny, like because folks like you and like and DevOps engineers, they're really smart. They're like, "Oh, this is just annoying. Just get in my way," and then they find workarounds and basically work around these solutions. But this feels almost like the opposite. It's actually yeah. really easy and a pleasure to use. So I actually want to use this, and and so it's like a win-win for everyone. Um, and then the other big win, I think, is yeah, like SSO for everything. So so no more shared database credentials, no SSH keys. Like um, yeah, just. A lot, a lot of good stuff. So, you know, thank you very much for sharing this. Any, any final thoughts from you? 
No, I just, what you said right now really resonated with me. I, I could not go back to the old way of doing things. I could not go back to jumping through hoops, getting on VPNs, finding shared credentials in LastPass. Oh, where is it? How do I, when was the last time this thing was rotated? Is it going yeah. to work? You know, sometimes passwords don't work. Maybe they get rotated, they don't get updated in the secret yeah. store. Um, well, you have so like are, password new, password old. Yeah, really. Password B two, final, yeah. final two. <laughs> because yeah. nobody wants to change it. Yeah. Yeah. And so this right. this really solves problems for um, administrators and leaders, but also it, it does uh, almost remove friction uh, from yeah. the engineers day to day. It's much simpler. It's much more enjoyable to use. Um, Everybody's yeah. winning. Yeah. Sounds awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think we're going to wrap up this call. This was a really good demo. I hope uh, you, the viewers, enjoyed it too. Um, if you want to get started with Border Zero, I suggest go to borderzero.com. Um, I would recommend you check out some of our blogs, our YouTube channel. And if you just want to get started and this sounded interesting, there's a big sign up now button on the website or go to portal.borderzero.com and, and register for free. We have a freemium solution so you can sign up and uh, make your AWS resources available. And as you saw today, it should all be possible within just a few minutes. So thanks everyone for watching and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next video. So, See you next time. You.